Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning, as you have entered the sanctuary, or perhaps on Wednesday night when you were here, you had the opportunity to receive a nail. So I hope that you have your nail handy and that you will be uh, holding it as we read the scripture this morning and as we move through the message. We uh, have been distributing this devotion book called Your Nail. There is also information in the order of worship as to how uh, you can use a QR code to access uh, it with Kindle and with Nook products. Uh, we want you to be aware of, of this piece as well because the Your Nail goes with the messages uh, during this particular um, emphasis. But I would uh, offer an apology because it looks like we're just about out of the devotion books. And so we'll be ordering more of these uh, and have those available to you just as soon as possible. Hear this word of scripture from John's Gospel, chapter 19. And carrying the cross by himself, Jesus went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Dear ones, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When we gathered here on Ash Wednesday for our service, many of you received your nail that night, and some of you have just received your nail since you arrived here this morning. If you received it on Wednesday night, I have a question. Did you bring your nail back with you today, or, or did you take one from the container? I hope, whichever the case is, that you have it handy now. My wish for you is that you begin to claim this nail as your own. That doesn't mean writing your name on it uh, or painting it in any such way that you can always determine which one is yours, but that you begin to identify with your nail. So if you received your nail on Wednesday night, it could be that you've already had the experience of it being inconvenient, of maybe making you uncomfortable. We started out with two different types of nails. One had a very blunt point on it, and the other is rather sharp. The one with the sharp point, some of you recognize, it's a horseshoe nail. Uh, so it really is a very sharp nail. So take your nail in your hand. Uh, if you haven't done so already, gentlemen, I, you may be keeping yours in your pants pocket, and that's where mine is during my waking hours. Ladies, yours may be in your purse, but take it out and have it in your hand. Each Sunday, I want you to, to be close to it during the message. We'll have nails available each week, so if you forget yours, you can always pick one up as you enter the sanctuary. If, if you lose yours, then we want you to, to have another one. But I know that it's risky for us to, to have these nails. I know that it's risky for a couple of reasons. One of the risks is that um, you, may, um, you may focus on the nail and, and not the message, but I'm willing to take that risk because if it's your nail that you're focusing on, I, I'm sure that God's leading you in a direction uh, that's going to be helpful as you continue uh, this journey over these Lenten weeks. Um, one of the things about the nails, I really do ask you to hang on to them uh, because sometimes they can wind up in a parking lot. And I want this to be a really good experience for everyone, okay? So uh, do hang on to your nail in the coming weeks. Uh, I wonder what your experience of your nail has been over the past few days. Um, I'll be pleased uh, if you 
share your experiences with me and and some of our folks uh, since the first two services have taken the time to, to stop me and say, I, I've got just a, a short nail story. Uh, I, I, I wanna tell you what this is meaning to me at, at, at this point in the journey. Um, it's possible that there may be some uh, in our congregation who find the whole concept to be so crude or maybe so distasteful that you've just put your nail away. You've, you've put it away, you've forgotten about it already. You're trying not to think about it. Um, I, I remind you that um, the nail is very much a part of uh, our spiritual story in the life of Jesus and that the nail is that which held him to the cross and that was a willing choice that he made. Sometimes I find myself going back to um, another church um, experience, a, a, another time when uh, a woman from the congregation was uh, in my office having a conversation with me and and, and I soon realized that she had just kind of, um, kind of gone away in, during the conversation. And, and she was transfixed on a, a painting that was in my office of the crucifixion. And after a moment when the conversation just kind of faded away to nothing, I, I said, what do you think of the painting? And, and her response was, I don't like it. And I said, really, why, why is it that you don't like it? And she said, because it's just too cruel. And my question then was, as if the crucifixion wasn't cruel, yes, she said, I know that, but I choose not to think about it. Now, some of you over the last few days may have already had a painful experience with your nail. Uh, perhaps you came to touch that sharp point and it pricked. Uh, maybe it's created memories not unlike the one that Bob Garver shared at the beginning of our service this morning of how on a, on a summer vacation trip it kind of got ruined when he stepped on a nail. Um, some of you uh, may still be struggling with what this is going to turn out to be like and, and I just want to urge you to, to stay in the struggle over the next several weeks. And between examining your nail and between reading uh, those Lenten devotions, uh, that we'll come to grips together with the anguish that's associated with Jesus' crucifixion and, and what that means for us. Now, between reviewing some of the writers of uh, uh, commentators on John's Gospel in this 19th chapter and, and also going back into my mind to a movie that was released 10 years ago on Ash Wednesday, um, that whole thing with the passion of the Christ has kept me unsettled um, in, in different ways, but one of the ways when I read this passage is, is something that, um, that I really hadn't thought about before. It is we know that from Scripture, Jesus had to carry his own cross. Some of the Gospels say that eventually Simon of Cyrene was compelled to help Jesus with his cross, but th the new insight that I had was how it must have felt to have to carry one's own instrument of torture uh, and of execution. I'd never thought about it. I'd never thought about the emotional agony or the fear or the anger that would accompany having to be a part of such an act. Carrying one's own cross, wouldn't that be like having to help build one's own gallows or, or maybe even pulling the lever so that you dropped down through it to your end? Or, or maybe having to push the button that would ultimately bring about one's death. Many criminals tried to resist carrying their cross, but they were beaten into submission. There was no escaping it, no escaping the emotional and physical agony that's associated with this death. So having examined your nail for either a few days now or, or maybe just a few minutes, what would you do with, with your nail? How would you choose to use your nail? And, and so if you've read the devotion and you're beginning to think, okay, this is starting to sound familiar. Well, I believe this was yesterday's devotion, wasn't it? And, and a part of that devotion was what would you do in, in this situation with your nail? There's not much that you can really do with one nail, is there? I mean, maybe you can hammer it into a wall and hang a picture on it. Perhaps you can hammer it into the wall of your garage and, and hang some simple tool on it. 
Um, maybe you can put two boards together that are small and only would require one nail. In our scripture reading for today, one nail is all that it took. It just took one. And it was very unintentional on Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor's uh, part. Um, he never intended to make such a deep theological statement or even the political statement that he ended up making. All that, that he wanted to do, get this, all that Paul really, or all that Pontius Pilate really wanted to do was he just wanted to irritate Jesus' adversaries. Uh, and he ended up succeeding at it. You remember that Jesus um, never denied it when Pilate asked, are you the king of the Jews? And so Pilate just took his response, well, you say so. You say that I am. And he followed suit and used that claim as Jesus' own death sentence. Every criminal that was being crucified by the Romans had to have the charge or the charges attached to the cross so that everyone could see. So Jesus' charge was treason. It was insurrection. He claimed to be the king of the Jews when everyone knew that Herod, Herod over in the palace, he's the king of the Jews. So Pilate took his nail, figuratively, he took his nail, his one and only nail, and he placed the charge over Jesus' head, and that's all that it took, just one. So Jesus was publicly mocked. He was crowned with a crown of thorns before his own people. He was hailed king of the Jews, all because the religious leaders wanted rid of Jesus. But don't you know, they hoped for something less obvious than what happened. They hoped for a different way for this to end because they vehemently disagreed with what Pilate put on the sign. But there it was, right in front of God and everybody. It was written on three languages used in Judea during Roman rule. It was written in Hebrew, and that's for the everyday Jewish person. It was written in Latin because that's the language of the Roman Empire. It's written in Greek because that's the language of commerce. And so what had initially started out as a, a, a movement unique to just a small group, the Jesus movement was just a, a small group in Judaism, now went worldwide. With this one sign, it went global, for it was being announced that Jesus is Lord. And in lifting Jesus up on the cross... The truth of Jesus' own prediction about his death was confirmed. Back in John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, Jesus says, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And so here Jesus is, and his being where he is. And with that sign, it announces to all of the world that this is the Savior of the world. I can't imagine just how badly Pilate wanted to humiliate these Jewish leaders. But he did. And he brought it about. It really is a moment of profound irony because the leaders who had tried to appease Rome by denouncing Jesus as a political criminal and by renouncing loyalty to governance by Rome, they won nothing in what they had done other than just get Jesus off the scene, or so they thought. So according to the sign over Jesus' head, Jesus was crucified as their king. Now, I would offer to you that there's something to learn just from that. And what I would offer to you is that there is no gain in denying Jesus. I think that's what we see here. There is no gain in denying Jesus. Even Pilate, who thought he was in control, is proved to be wrong because Jesus ends up being enthroned. It's just not in the palace. He's enthroned on the cross. And, and that's where we realize that we too begin to be confounded by this whole God in Jesus Christ event. We become confounded with the wonder and the power of the Incarnation. 
Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one that is sent by God into the world to save the world by revealing that God loves the world. And Jesus is also the man who will die on a cross, bleeding, as the song says, from his head, see from his hands, his feet, his pierced side, and wrapped in linen cloths. Ah, when was the last time Jesus was wrapped in linen cloths at his birth, swaddling birth clothes and laid to rest in a borrowed garden tomb. The Common English Bible that was released a few years ago as a translation refers to Jesus as the human one. And because Jesus is human, because he can and he will die, he became the very fullness of God's love. And in his death, Jesus gave up what the rest of us human ones, what the rest of us human beings hold most dear. What Jesus gave up, and what we hold more dear than anything else is life. And he gave his life because he chose to do so in love. And so the two now become defined together. Life and love. Life becomes an expression of love. It becomes the ultimate gift. Love unto death becomes the only source of life. And so Jesus' gift of his life on the cross is ultimately a gesture of generosity and grace. We don't always think about it that way. But in Jesus giving himself, it is a generous act. And it is an act of grace. It is a pure gift. Not required, but given so that you and I can understand the fullest extent of God's love for you and for me and for all of this world. So it's really a very powerful image, isn't it, how it all comes together. This meaning of the gift of life and love in Jesus. But it's also something that Jesus asks his followers, his disciples, those who will come after them in this world to conform in their own lives, to do in their own lives. For it's in the command in John 15 where Jesus says, Love one another. Love one another just as I have loved you. It all goes hand in hand because it's impossible to understand what Jesus' love is if we separate it from the cross. Now, on down the road, we get to the good news, of course. On down the road, we get to the transformation power that we see in the resurrection as it too reshapes the world. But for now, for now it's the crucifixion that we look to. For now it's the crucifixion because in it we understand Jesus' love and then to understand who Jesus and God are so that we are empowered and enabled to go forth into the world and to be ambassadors of that same love that we have experienced for ourselves. So in the power of Jesus' death on the cross, he lives out the life for which he was born and into which he was sent by bearing an ultimate witness to the truth. And that truth is this, that Jesus will give what is most precious to he and to God. So we're fond of saying that God is love. We're fond of saying that Jesus is love. We're, we really like those words. But often they, um, they roll off our lips without a great deal of thought. For when we really say those words, what it means is that God loves without limits. What it really means is that Jesus loves without limits. It's not simply about emotion or about something that we feel in the human way but they both love to the end and they both love freely. For Jesus' disciples to love as he has loved means that we must love one another with a love that is derived from and shaped by his gift of love and by the gift of his life on the cross. For Jesus' followers to love as he loves 
Now that means that we embrace the cross. Well, I'm, I'm not talking about the brass cross or, or the one in the stained glass, but that we embrace the cross as the ultimate measure of fidelity to God, to give without counting, and to love without restraint. And we know this. We know this because we've heard the story. We've heard the story over and over and over again. We, we know this because we've read the story. We've listened to pastors and teachers tell the story. And therein is a danger. The danger is we've heard it so we think we know it. May God grant us the grace during this Lenten season to be surprised. To have those moments in our journey, even if it comes through something as simple as a nail, when we have new insights into God's wondrous love that is being extended to us. Pilate was willing to use his nail to say who he thought Jesus was. The question, I think, that ended yesterday's devotion is, uh, what would you write on your sign? What would you write on your sign? Someone was telling me this morning that they were sharing that devotion as a family, and one member of the family said, I'd write, I'll be back. So who do you say he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? And how would you use your nail? How will you use your nail in these coming weeks? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, you, uh, you've brought us here on this first Sunday of Lent. You've granted us a place where we sing together. We affirm our faith together. We hear your word and we pray together. And now you send us out. You send us out into a world that needs love that needs to be shown a love that transcends all other loves. Grant us the wherewithal to be ambassadors of such love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is a familiar hymn. You may not even need your hymnal for this song. It's number 378. Amazing Grace, we'll do verse 1, verse 2, and verse 6. Amazing Grace, verses 1, 2, and 6. As you're able, would you please stand?
The season of Lent begins with lights still blazing from the transfiguration of Jesus of last week. It hasn't been so long since we were anticipating his light piercing the darkness of this world. During Lent, we become aware of Jesus' journey toward the cross and our own life journey. Sometimes the darkness of evil feels so strong, it seems the light may be eclipsed the closer we move toward Holy Week. Rather than a wreath of greenery, ours is a wreath of dried vines and nails. Instead of lighting a candle each week, we will extinguish a candle each week. The governor, Pontius Pilate, chose to use a nail to declare to the world who Jesus is, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Such a declaration should have brought blinding insight to this world. Instead, the world took a painful step into the darkness.